Welcome and thank you for joining today. Our uh, press briefing then, which gives us the opportunity to communicate about very important subjects across our state, whether it's COVID-19, the economic recovery, or any other serious conversation we need to have. We appreciate those who tune in and those who are here to, uh, to engage. The first thing I want to address is the uptick in cases in coronavirus and COVID-19 cases, positive cases in our state. Um, these, in the last week, we've had an uptick of those cases. It's not unexpected given that folks are out and about much more uh, moving around our state. It's very important that we follow this information, this data, not only the cases that we have in our state, but the very important data point of hospital capacity. And fortunately, our hospital capacity is very stable in spite of this uh, uptick of cases, but we will continue to track that and, and make sure we monitor um, that important data. I also want to encourage Tennesseans that one of the reasons we got to a place uh, where uh, we're to, to the place that we could open our economy in a greater way. One of the reasons is because Tennesseans did um, what helps to mitigate the spread of a virus like COVID-19. Washing hands, um, staying home when sick, um, getting a test, which is incredibly important for Tennesseans to remember, wearing a mask. Uh, and we have continued distribution of the free masks that we provided um, the EPA, as you know, has, has um, uh, reported and made sure that we all know that those masks are safe for Tennesseans, so we've begun the redistribution, the continued distribution of those masks. But all of those things, social distancing measures that Tennesseans have taken have allowed us to move forward in this environment. Uh, of an opened economy, it's incredibly important that Tennesseans continue to do that, continue to follow those practices so we can mitigate uh, the spread of this virus and manage and maintain it as we, as we go through the summer. A couple of other things we're going to talk about today are nursing homes in Tennessee. We're going to talk about support that we're providing for Tennessee businesses uh, and continued efforts to ensure that our minority communities receive uh, the testing and the treatment that is necessary in the midst of this pandemic. Our nursing homes and our long-term care facilities have been closed to outside visitors since March. Um, this measure has been necessary in order to protect the most vulnerable of our citizens, the elderly, and for whom this virus has been particularly cruel. Um, at the same time, it's created a tremendous hardship for those residents and for their family members uh, because they've been unable to visit with one another, friends and family, for almost three months. Every nursing home and long-term care facility resident uh, will have been tested by this Friday, and we have been working with, and I'm, I'm very grateful to the nursing home and long-term care facility industry for working with our health department to not only uh, get the testing done of the residents, but to ensure that we have a process for repeat testing for staff members in those facilities all across the state. Um, our unified command group has worked very closely with this, with this industry to take the steps necessary to really to provide safety for the most vulnerable in our community. But today I signed an executive order that will allow these facilities to again open their doors to visitors starting on Monday, June the 15th. Uh, we've set expectations that specific safety protocols will be followed because while we want to provide for an opportunity for visitation and for family members to once again reconnect with their loved ones in long-term care facilities, we can't um, ignore the fact that these are our most vulnerable citizens and so there will be strict safety protocols put in place at the same time, um, we, we do want to open up those facilities for visitation. Dr. Pierce is going to give more information about, about what safe visitation actually looks like in a few minutes when, we, when, we, when she gives her report. 
Uh, and if you are planning to visit your loved ones in a nursing home, I, I encourage you to show grace to those facilities who are having to make dramatic changes in a very short period of time uh, because we wanted to make sure that folks could have access to their loved ones, but uh, we're grateful for the hard work that those facilities are doing. This is one of our most vulnerable populations and we all have to work together to, to make sure that we protect them. If you are going to visit as well, uh, get a test. You know, testing, and I'll say this over and over again, testing not only provides you information about your own health, but it actually provides it provides the state with information that understands where cases are and therefore where spread happens. And it really provides protection for your neighbors as well when you get a test. So particularly if you're gonna go back into a nursing home facility, please get a test. Individuals have taken advantage of, of uh, voluntary free testing throughout this pandemic. We have worked really hard to make testing widely available because we know that that's one of the most important uh, things that we can do to fight this virus. But uh, I want to call on Tennessee businesses today. Uh, we invite employers, especially those of our larger facilities, manufacturing facilities, large numbers of employees, to uh, work with us to coordinate pop-up testing facilities for your companies and for your employees. Again, it helps all Tennesseans when any Tennessean gets a test. And uh, as more employees return to work, we want to work with employers uh, to have those employees tested. Last week, state employees began to come back uh, to work in their office place, and and we have we, we offered testing to state to state workers. We want to do the same thing for industries all across the state. So our unified command group can work with any employer that wants to that wants to set up a pop up test. For their facility, um, information is available on our website and we encourage uh, employers to engage in that. Throughout the pandemic, we have repeatedly seen how COVID-19 has exposed particularly uh, barriers to minority communities. And we've, been, uh, we've made a great effort to be thoughtful in our approach to providing materials in our health departments in multiple languages and to engage uh, trusted community partners so that we can provide more access to more people all across the state. Last month, we worked with uh, housing and urban development agencies in our major metropolitan areas, uh, Memphis, Nashville, Chattanooga, and Knoxville, to provide free voluntary testing to residents right in their neighborhood, uh, particularly in an effort to serve folks who might have transportation barriers. Uh, we want to continue to build on those efforts and continue to build partnerships. I want to I, I, I want to make a special shout out and, and uh, express gratitude, especially to churches in Memphis, who are actually working together to create uh, a large testing event this weekend. Our faith communities have played an important role, and continue to do so. But we're grateful for their for their work this weekend to especially provide more testing to. Uh, the communities that they are in. Um, we're also working with our federally qualified health clinics across the state to make sure that we provide uh, access to more testing for our minority populations. Kimberly Lamar from our, uh, Dr. Lamar from our Department of Health's Office of Minority and Health Disparity Elimination is uh, with us today and I've asked her to, to come up and uh, say a few additional comments uh, about our efforts to reach all Tennesseans. Dr. Lamar. Good afternoon and thank you, Governor. During this heightened time, as we pursue justice and as we work to rebuild and recover, it's more important than ever that we maintain health in our communities. The impact of COVID has been significant on minority communities, particularly our African American communities and our Latino populations. Particularly as um, the heightened um, work um, that has evolved and that is needed um, as a result of many conversations that have been held across the state. It is, it is pertinent that we work to ensure that health is equitable, accessible, and attainable for all Tennesseans. The Department of Health is committed to doing this work, and we are also committed to addressing and advancing health equity. 
Over the past six weeks, the Office of Minority Health and Rural Health have engaged hundreds of faith and community leaders, academic partners, and local and state government officials in, in the Health Disparities Task Force. These, this meeting of the task force occurs weekly and has revealed and uncovered many barriers, challenges, and needs of our minority populations that have hindered the ability to attain health. The task force has tackled topics on mental health, substance misuse, physical and intellectual disabilities, the needs for seniors, and most importantly, COVID testing expansion efforts. We've connected these agencies with resources and have ensured that we're moving forward to address many of these barriers. Our response has resulted in improved communications in the form of PSAs, social media and website postings, as well as infographics and representative and are representative of diverse communities and are responsive to the various languages, dialects, and responsive to the channels by which our diverse communities receive and share information. Testing efforts focused largely on our metro and urban communities across the state have been critical to COVID response. Our offices have coordinated testing efforts in partnership with local health departments and community-based clinical partners, such as our FQHCs and our community faith-based partners. Um, we've been able to engage our um, local officials in providing testing to our multifamily housing communities and been able to pursue and, and, and continue to engage and share information relative to improving um, the health um, and, and awareness of um, the COVID um, positivity in those communities. In Chattanooga, largely events have been held to increase access specifically to our Hispanic and Latino community. We have partnered with SIMPA, um, Community Care Clinic, as well as the Chattanooga Health Department. In Nashville, the coordination and partnership of organizations such as Matthew Walker, Neighborhood Health, um, Connect Us, and Meharry Medical College have been critical to the continued testing availability across Davidson County. The faith community, as the governor mentioned earlier, has been critical and continues to be a valued and trusted partner in the work that we're doing in terms of COVID response. Our offices in work, um, is working collaboratively, co collaboratively with our churches to provide community-wide testing. Most, in, most recently in Nashville, we've partnered with Mount Zion uh, Baptist Church to provide testing at two of their campuses. In Chattanooga, Knoxville, Memphis, a number of similar events have been held and are continuing to be scheduled to ensure that that testing is available to the community wide. Next weekend, June 19th and 20th, we are working collaboratively with several local churches, Mississippi Boulevard, First Baptist Broad, Divine Faith, and, and Mount Zion um, Baptist Church Parkway location in Memphis to provide community wide testing. We are grateful to our clinical partners, our clinical partners in Memphis, to assist us in ensuring that these events are a success. More information on these events can be um, found on our website um, as well as our social media pages. Again, I want to emphasize that as we re-engage socially, as we participate in protest, as we gather together, it is more important than ever that we maintain the health, our health, to ensure our community health. This is important to realizing the justice and the changes that we are working so hard to realize. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lamore. Um, I want to I want to make a couple of comments before I ask Dr. Piercy to give her report on economic recovery. Um, I have a, a lot of optimism about a lot of things in our state. We are. Um, in a process of transformation, and that's a good thing. And one of the one of the things that is happening right now is our economy is has been opened back up and is beginning um, to recover. And we, our economic recovery group, uh, has been tracking recovery. And part of the way they do that is by communicating with businesses across the state. So they survey a number of businesses about what's actually happening in their companies and with their employees uh, to try to gauge and understand uh, just what's happening on the ground in our economy. Uh, the, the economic recovery group uh, fielded a survey and they shared some of the highlights of those and I'll, I'll, I'll just give you a couple of points that were encouraging. The, the, they ask businesses uh, if they have been unable to generate revenue, are you currently unable to generate revenue? And the businesses that report that they 
we're unable to generate revenue dropped in, in a one month period because we've done this survey twice, dropped from 27% of those reporting a month ago that they could not generate revenue to 12% today. Um, that, that's movement in the right direction. Many more of our companies are back in business and generating revenue and beginning the process of uh, providing opportunities for jobs for folks the, the percentage of businesses that are reporting no layoffs or furloughs has increased this month to 64%. So 64% of the over 6,000 businesses that were that responded to our survey said that they uh, were reporting no layoffs or furloughs. So uh, our unemployment numbers are improving. It's very challenging. As we all know, many Tennesseans are, are out of work. Uh, and that's been a difficult situation for sure, but, but we're moving in the right direction, and that is very encouraging. Also, the majority of Tennessee businesses that were surveyed said they uh, knew about the Tennessee Pledge and they were able to comply with it. That was encouraging. Um, we, we remain encouraged that in spite of this tremendous health crisis and economic crisis, uh, we have better days ahead for us as a state and encouraged by that economic a report. Dr. Piercy, would you keep please come and give us a health report? Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Today's numbers will be out within the hour, so these are yesterday's figures, uh, but the total case count was 27,575 with 9,127 active cases. We have now done over a half million tests and that number continues to grow each day. As the governor mentioned, I wanna spend most of my time today talking about the nursing home visitation guidelines. As he's mentioned, and as we have said just countless times, it is the most vulnerable population. The devastation that occurs when one of these individuals, a resident in a nursing home or a long-term care facility gets infected is incredibly critical and it's absolutely much worse than if those in the general population do. And so restrictions are important, but social and emotional well-being is also incredibly important. As he mentioned, uh, the last few of the long-term care facilities are being tested this week, and so that will complete all of the uh, testing statewide. And then beginning no later than July 1st, and some facilities have already done it, uh, then uh, the staff will begin weekly retesting in nursing homes uh, on a forward going basis. As I mentioned, our top priority is safety of both the residents and the staff. But we wanna balance that with their social, emotional, and psychological well being. So we are announcing the opening next week of limited visitation. Facilities will have to meet some requirements to do this. They will be located in counties with lower disease burdens. They have to agree to meet the prerequisites that are defined by our guidance and agree to the restrictions and screening protocols of those that come to visit. We are going to be allowing three options for visiting. One is outdoor visitation with proper distancing. Another is indoor or outdoor visitation with a visitation booth. Most commonly, that's with a plexiglass barrier. And then finally, there are some very limited yet uh, available options for in-room visitation because we do understand that there are some residents that aren't able uh, to uh, physically tolerate the other two options. So you'll see that guidance forthcoming pretty soon uh, for facilities. I will reiterate exactly what the governor said is please give these facilities some grace. Uh, they have been under very uh, strict restrictions for the last several months and it's going to take them several days or perhaps longer to be able to comply with our strict guidelines. And I do acknowledge that these are quite restrictive, but that's okay because we need to be able to do everything we can to protect this most vulnerable population while allowing for their social and emotional well-being. Secondly, I also want to reiterate um, his comments about we have seen a slight uptick in our case count. Uh, this is not unexpected. People are moving about, uh, and we knew this was going to happen, uh, but we are watching it very closely. 
Fortunately, our hospital resources are stable and uh, are forecasted to do so. Uh, and we are in uh, continual conversations with the Tennessee Hospital Association and many of our providers statewide just to make sure we have uh, good eyes on what those resources are. As a reminder, just because we're moving forward, don't forget the basic tenets. Distance yourself, stay at home if you're sick, wash your hands, and wear your cloth face coverings. And finally, I just want to uh, reiterate our continued focused efforts on communities of color. I appreciate Assistant Commissioner Dr. Kimberly Lamar, whom you heard from earlier, as she uh, explained our efforts to increase and expand access to testing as well as wraparound services. Our department continues to engage in culturally appropriate manner. And our commitment to confronting racism and eliminating disparities is not just a focus during this pandemic, but it's for the long haul. Thank you. Thank you all again. Uh, we'll, we'll open up to questions. I want to remind you that um, Dr. Piercy is here for questions. Dr. Lamar, uh, General Holmes with Department of Military, uh, Director Sheehan with TEMA. I see Penny Swin back there um, with Department of Education in case anyone has questions there as well. Um, so we will we'll open it up to questions. You know, I, um, I think we're in a place um, right now in our country that's unique. This country has, uh, I'll just say broadly before I specifically answer your question, the country has, since the signing of the Declaration of Independence, this country has been in a process of transformation from day one, um, moving, ever moving toward a more perfect union, and we're still in that process. And uh, we, there are, in the last few weeks, we've had an elevated conversation, certainly around the racial reconciliation and disparities. And that progress, while we've made a lot of progress, we have a long way to go. And that progress needs to be accelerated. And we'll take steps in that direction. I want to be a part of that process. Um, this, this bill that that lessens the height of the proclamation of this particular day that's particularly painful to African Americans, that's an important step forward. I'm glad that they made it. I think we're in a process. I think we're in a process in this country, and I'm grateful for steps in the right direction. <laughs> You know, I think that um, it's really important that we have more dialogue and not less. And so quick, we're, we're so often we're so quick to, um, to draw lines and choose sides and dialogue stops when that happens. And so any Tennessean uh, and I think it's been especially made aware, even in the last several weeks, that we all need to engage in more dialogue. I think we've had a lot of opportunity in the last few weeks to, to have dialogue, to learn from one another. And I believe we're, we have an opportunity for, um, for movement in the right direction. As I said, this country has never stopped in its movement in the right direction. And we cannot, we, we cannot stop now. In fact, we should accelerate that movement in the right direction. 
dialogue, whether it occurs in the legislature, in the public square. And I know for myself, um, having conversations with my family, with my friends, with law enforcement, with black leaders across this state, um, dialogue has taught me that there are no complicated answers. I, I mean, there are no uh, easy answers. The answers are complicated. Uh, but it doesn't diminish the value of those dialogues that will actually allow us to move forward. That should happen. It should happen on the floor of the legislature. Uh, I think there have been examples where it has happened in the legislature, even this past week. Uh, but I would encourage all of us, we're at a place in America that we're in a unique spot. We're not, we're not in a unique spot in that change is happening because it's been happening since we began as a nation. But we're in a particular spot uh, where a particular issue has been elevated and we need to have more dialogue around that. And I look forward to being a part of that. Yeah, you know, I've spoken on that issue before, as you have you've, yeah. have you've asked me, you and I have talked about it, and Chris and I have talked about it, multiple folks. Um, I've said before, something should be done there. It's a part of the need for greater dialogue. There are no easy answers. There's no quick solutions. I've said at the very least, we ought to have provide context. It isn't my decision, uh, but I want to weigh into that. The Capital Commission ultimately decides that. And, you know, we've made some progress. We appointed new folks to the Capital Commission. Kind of that whole process got derailed by COVID. There's now a vacancy on that. I'll reappoint that, com that, that uh, vacancy. And I expect that commission will be meeting in the coming months. Uh, but but on, the, on the subject broadly, um, just like the Nathan Bedford Forrest Day, Nathan Bedford Forrest is a particular individual whose role in history is particularly painful for African Americans, and therefore we should consider things around that individual uniquely, I think, including the bus. Would you advise the Commission that you would prefer it to come down? It's not my role to advise the Capital Commission, um, but I certainly can make comments and will be over, over the time uh, about how I feel about it. Well, um, I think opening up dialogue brings about change. And I think listening, intentionally listening, creating um, venues, meeting with law enforcement and community leaders to talk, about, um, to talk about law enforcement and the relationship between law enforcement and community, uh, community leaders. Those are actionable steps. Um, so, Increasing dialogue will bring about an accelerated transformation on the issue, for example, of racial reconciliation. I actually think that's a very substantive um, thing to do, and I plan to do so in the weeks and months ahead. What does racial reconciliation mean for you, and how do we achieve that? I'd answer that by saying, uh, based on the last few weeks of my life, uh, reconciliation for me will be defined by um, listening to those who are uh, most who are most involved in racial reconciliation and understanding what it means to them uh, that's going to that's going to help me in knowing how to go forward i think being aware that my experiences only define my view but others experiences will help um, inform my view and that's how that's how I'll approach this. I have a question really big for Commissioner Searcy. If you mind um, since the beginning Commissioner you talked about how the state was expecting an update as we reopen business in the state. Um, and you're talking about you're gonna be monitoring this, this number. Is there a scenario where you see 
Sure, I, I think that's uh, something that's on everyone's radar. And so we're watching it very closely. But I'll point you back to something that I remember it was in this very room, we floated the concept early on of flattening the curve. And flattening the curve is all about hospital resources and making sure that we have enough assets and capacity in our healthcare system to take care of any surge that might occur. Uh, and so that's the primary metric that we're watching. As I mentioned, it's completely expected that the case count would go up, but I would caution you to not take that in singularity uh, because you have to put that in the context of hospital capacity. Uh, you know what I'd say, Chris, is uh, I've learned over the last few weeks that my views um, need to be informed, especially on very important subjects that impact the lives of Tennesseans. And if I'm going to make a decision around something that is as controversial and that has as much negative impact in the minds of many African Americans as that issue does, then I want to have dialogue about that before I make a quick statement about well, what well, I think well, well, about what I think should happen. It's very easy to, and it's very tempting actually, to um, to find an answer overnight to very complicated issues that have been hundreds of years in the making in our country, and I'm, I'm not going to fall into that temptation. What's stopping you from acting, and who would it hurt by removing that buck? Yeah. I, I've said this is a process, and I'm going to follow that process, and that process is movement in the right direction, and it's listening, and I intend to do so. And one quick follow-up, just if I may, on unemployment. You said there were 600,000 people who filed in early March. Do you have a sense of Yeah, I can't. I, I would have to get that from Department of Labor specifically. Certainly, our unemployment new claims files have fallen week after week for I think the last nine weeks, which is a very positive movement, which means people are going back to work. Um, but I can't answer that question directly. But I can get you that information. Our Department of Labor would have that information. I've been trying. I, I, I'll get it for you. Thank you. It, it would be a projection, right? Because we don't know exactly who has or has not. It, a lot of that depends on their reporting or their claiming unemployment, but we, we certainly can make some projections there. There should be projections. You've got about uh, four billion in the reserve right now, and planning to add about 575 million uh, over the next year and a half, or so the year of 13 months, really. How bad really is the state's economic situation? Yeah, I'm not sure what your $575 million is. Not, not in the new budget. <clears throat> so let me tell you how bad the state's economic budget is. It's a half a billion dollar shortfall to close out this year, half a billion dollars, and it's projected to be $1 billion in next year. In a, uh, in, in a state budget, uh, $1.5 billion shortfall is a major challenge for us. It will require department cuts. It will require eliminating all of the uh, increases that were placed in the budget before. It will, uh, it will require tapping into reserves that we have 
in different departments all across the state. It'll require a very disciplined approach that I feel very confident that we can make uh, going forward. And, and that is w in part what our reserves are there for and they will be used. I, no, I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll go offline go over that budget issue with you, but we're making significant reductions in previously planned spending, including cuts in every department, and actually tapping fund reserve funds to make up the deficit, not add to those uh, to those reserve funds. Dr. Pierce, you want to answer that? Yeah, related to the Renfro mask, uh, we did uh, initially pursue some independent testing, primarily because we didn't believe we would actually hear back from the EPA uh, in a timely or directed manner. Uh, we were pleasantly surprised earlier this week to get a full report of safety from the EPA, uh, which we considered to be uh, the gold standard on those um, different chemicals, and so we have canceled our independent testing and are endorsing the use of those masks. And what's the, I mean, what's the uh, testing that made our hands first? We've got 20,000 masks that we're holding distribution of right now. What can you tell us right now? We've uh, instructed our warehouse to go ahead and continue uh, with distribution of those, and we would give him the same encouragement. As we've already mentioned, uh, you know, as we're seeing case numbers go back up, uh, cloth face coverings of any kind uh, will be uh, highly advisable, and so uh, if he's got those sitting there, they need to get out in the hands of the public. So to answer your question about hospital capacity, uh, this morning inpatient uh, and ICU availability was both at about 20% of state capacity. If you'll compare that to uh, when everything was, was closed down and elective procedures weren't going on, that was in the 24 to 26% range. Uh, so we have seen the expected decrease in capacity related to the increase of elective procedures, uh, but that is still uh, well within reason as far as statewide capacity. Uh, related to your question about uh, case count increases related to the protest, uh, we haven't seen any kind of specific trend that we can link to that generally, uh, more so around the increase in movement uh, of, of people, particularly starting around the Memorial Day holiday, um, and uh, have started to see that, uh, which also does coincide with some of the protest activity, so we can't make that direct link. You know, I think the issue of criminal justice reform is, yeah, it's really important. It's been important to me. It's actually important to the General Assembly. As you know, the, the, the legislation that we proposed on criminal justice reform was make, in the process of making its way through the legislature and committees. Uh, it had fiscal note, it had cost attached to it, and so we made the decision to, um, as we did with uh, the majority of issues that had cost associated with them because of the economic challenges that we faced. We made the decision to withdraw that, but I was very encouraged about the progress we made, and I, I expect that, that we will uh, make even more progress in, in, that, in that vein going forward.
discuss what the process may look like of altering the county seal, which bears an image of the Confederate law. Now, they, they learned that the Tennessee Historic Commission uh, body that you yourself sit on, Governor, would ultimately have the final say of whether or not that would be allowed. So, were the county commission to pursue altering the seal, would you as a sitting member on that uh, commission support uh, allowing the Williamson County Commission to alter it too? Yeah, I don't know about that process. Uh, I haven't looked into it. I, I think that the most important thing that that community can do, just like um, any of these topics, like when Chris asked about protesters about the bust out there, the most important thing that people can do is communicate, speak their voice about what they, what they want to have done. Those community leaders should listen to the people in their community and make decisions around that regarding the protest i mean the the uh, the process of historical commission and how those decisions are made i, I haven't looked into that but um, those community leaders themselves uh, should engage in dialogue to understand the the importance and to have and to have conversation around those subjects that are that are particularly important right now As I said before, there's a process to this. I'm not, the, in, I'm not entirely the person responsible for that process. I have said this, though. Something should be done. Uh, that particular individual and his role in history is particularly painful to African Americans in this state. And for that reason, uh, I think there should be a strong consideration and strong dialogue around what happens to that to that uh, bus has been talked about for a long time and and, th and there will be a process that uh, determines that. It's not entirely up to me, but uh, something should be done. Uh, just like I answered uh, Sergio a while ago, what do I think about racial reconciliation? I, if it were entirely up to me, I, I would have the appropriate, I wouldn't, go based simply on my experience in my life, I would have the appropriate conversations with uh, people to inform my decision and then I'd make one. And that, that will be the process for me going forward on any of these, on any of these very important subjects that we have going forward. Yes, sir. I don't know. They didn't talk to me about that. I don't know. I don't know what their intention is. They didn't talk to me about it. That's all the time we have for questions. Yeah, and there, there, and until until I've had conversation with black leaders, and uh, and with uh, others who have an interest in it staying there, and w until I engage in dialogue, which I think, you know. Again, if, if I've learned anything over the last two weeks, it's that my own experiences don't define uh, the, the path forward necessarily. What's really important is that we not draw lines and choose sides. It's that we understand that these answers are complicated and they require dialogue. So what I would do is I would sit down with uh, I would sit down with those who advocate keeping it. I would sit down with those who advocate getting rid of it. I would consider my own experiences and my opinion about it. Uh, that should be formed and shaped by those, that dialogue going forward. And I actually think it re represents a very important process for making very difficult decisions that lie ahead if we're going to make progress in an area like racial reconciliation. I think one of the challenges for us in this country is that issues uh, become divisive and they become, um, and, and, it, and it's counterproductive to progress. And the way that we eliminate that divisiveness is to come together and have dialogue going forward on something like that. Do I what? I'm sorry. You talked about people like to hear from people who want to stay and people who want to 
Yeah. I, I, I will. I will be talking to those folks going forward. That's all the time yep. we have today. Thank you all.